Welcome everyone to this last day of the summer school. I hope you enjoyed also yesterday's talk and the rest of the school. And today we will have three talks as yesterday morning. And, and the title that is um, explained the three talks that we, we will have is Learning Algorithm and Radio Sensing for Communication Networks and Embedded Systems. We will start with uh, Professor Bansu. We already uh, welcomed him yesterday, but I will reintroduce him also today for the one of you that were not here yesterday. I hope none, none of you, but just in case. So David Bansu is an associate professor at the Department of Computer Science at the University of Pisa, where he leads the Pervasive Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. He holds a PhD in computer science and engineering from IMT Lucca, for which he has been awarded the 2009 Caglianiello Prize for the best Italian PhD thesis on neural networks. He has co-authored over 140 research works on deep neural networks, generative learning, Bayesian models, learning for graphs, continual learning, and distributed and embedding, embedding learning systems. He has been the coordinator of several European, national, and industrial research projects. He is VP, former secretary, and board member of the Italian Association for AI, a senior member of the IEEE and vice chair of the IEEE Net Neural Networks Technical Committee. He is associate editor of the IEEE Transactions on Neural Networks and Learning Systems and chairs the IEEE CIS Task Force on Learning for Structural Data. The talk of today will be more about applications. Yesterday, he introduced us uh, reservoir computing. And today, the, the, we will see how to apply reservoir computing for distributed and embedded systems. So let's welcome our speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you also ended up with twice DD, so I can question you on my curriculum bit and I, at the end of the day. Uh, okay, so uh, good morning, everybody, and thanks for being here. Despite this being the morning after the final night, so I know how hard it is to listen to that, to that alarm clock. Uh, today we're talking about uh, how we take those concepts that we introduced yesterday into something that is more related with the physical world, because we are basically talking about pervasive computing, how we do use these information processing systems, because in the end, that's what neural networks are, to process information that is available in a distributed environment, together with possibly computing devices that can consume it where it's produced, or maybe not, but we see why, or I'll try to convince you that for some, in some cases, some of the concepts that we've seen, namely randomization, limiting, uh, limiting uh, uh, learning to the final part of the neural network, this concept of dynamical systems as, as, a processing, as processing units in, uh, in neural networks, uh, are particularly uh, well um, uh, suited for this kind of applications. Uh, what we are talking basically uh, about today is apart from the usual, I try to sell you the technology with some motivation part, uh, I'm going to be touching upon three things, which should be more or less familiar to you, which is embedded, how do we do uh, and why it's interesting to use reservoir computing embedded, continual, because that's something that might come handy, continual learning, and federated learning, because it sort of comes with the distributed uh, setting. And then I'll try and conclude this thing by delivering you a some sort of advertisement about some work that we're doing uh, in which all these concepts are convergent into a sort of a X as a service architecture, where X is typically uh, learning. Okay, neural networks, so call it AI because it's more fashionable. So let, let me start with the with the introduction. And as usual, please just raise your hand, interrupt me at any time. It's only good for me and for the audience if I stop chatting every now and then. Now, 
the uh, selling point. The kind of scenario I refer to is, is what you might refer to as pervasive intelligence, pervasive AI. Is a scenario in which you have, again, of typically a real world, so typically a real world environment or whatever scale it is, which is sensorized. So you're collecting information about the world, about people working in that particular environment, living in that particular environment. So you have sensors, basically. And along with sensors, we have, you have uh, processing capabilities in the sensors, in the edge devices, in the regional devices, in the cloud, possibly. So the point here is on the top of this communication and sensing infrastructure and processing infrastructure, you want to put an information processing system based on your networks. Why do you want to do that? Well, basically, because uh, what neural networks can uh, allow you to do is transform physical sensors into virtual sensors. That's basically it. An accelerometer becomes, an, which is a transducer, can become then a sensor, a virtual sensor that can detect faults, that can detect activities, several different activities. So that's what neural networks are about, are tiny bits that you put on the top of a physical sensor to transform the physical sensor in a certain number of virtual sensor where each virtual sensor detects events of different sorts. Okay. Those events are not uh, necessarily bound uh, to only uh, events that pertain to the physical world, but since you have a lot of streaming data, including the streaming data that, that you use to um, sort of uh, run the distributed system, you might use it also to detect anomalies about the about the system or to implement part of the system itself, communication and, and computing system itself. Because in the end, what you're dealing with is stream of information, so sequences again. Okay, so if uh, neural networks are good at something, is at the fact that once you have the technology, the technology can be reapplied, it scales. Okay, provided that the kind of information you're using it with is the same, you just reuse the same code, you just reuse the same model over and over again. So given that this is the kind of application we're aiming at, what's the holy grail? What, what we would like to, uh, in an ideal world, to, to, to have in terms of uh, learning system that can really support this kind of, of application? Well, the desiderata are a couple, perhaps unsurprising. It needs to be efficient. We want the learning model that is efficient because we want it to be embeddable, for instance, on edge devices, on sensors, even on sensors, we might say that. And possibly, if we want to uh, give it an additional push, it has to be hardware friendly, meaning hardware friendly. Uh, with the term hardware friendly, I really mean that there might be a chance that at some point you can implement it in hardware because energy saving, because computational aspects are relevant. Okay, so picking up a, 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 let's say, a computational model, which is very far from what we can implement in hardware makes, uh, makes it, well, interesting anyway, but uh, it's a limitation because you know that at, at no point that model is gonna become something that, uh, that runs on, on an actual uh, uh, silico. Another thing that you might want, since we are not only interested in sticking very tiny models into very tiny things, is scalability. Because we also have the cloud. I mean, we, it's not that we don't like the cloud at all. There is also the cloud, and maybe you want a learning model that can scale from very tiny to, if I need it, very large. Okay. So being only low power is not, is not enough. And that also calls for another, for another uh, aspect, being communication friendly then. Because as soon as you put the cloud into, uh, into the equation, you want at some point to be sort of friendly towards the communication that from the edge, from the sensors reach, reach the cloud, okay? If you're not moving the data because nobody wants to move the data, otherwise the European Commission comes with a, with a big stick and beats us. But at some point, you might want to move the model from the, from the edge to the cloud. You want this process of transferring 
the model to be as nice as possible to your communication channel because you don't want to waste uh, most of you probably deal with communication aspects so uh, you know it better than me okay another aspect that you uh, would like to have is the simplicity of training possibly in a continual fashion because as soon as you deploy things in a very distributed manner uh, you want them to be also trainable possibly locally without having to move the model to the cloud all the time and then uh, to train it and then bring it back from the cloud to the device uh, in its uh, renewed uh, updated and upgraded version you want some of that to happen locally on at the outskirts of your of your network on the edge basically so you want some form of uh, nicety also in terms of uh, simplicity of brain. And then, yeah, in the end, overall, you want this model to facilitate distribution and federated learning. Uh, here, I'm not talking from a com computational and communication perspective. I'm really talking about the learning mechanism. You want a model which, if distributed, if federated, the underlying assumption of the model makes it easier to have a federated algorithm, okay? You want a model that if I want to use uh, weighted averaging, well, for that model, weighted averaging is a decent approximation of having a centralized model. Because if you pick up a model, which is super fancy, super nice, you uh, you have uh, 10,000 uh, copies of it distributed everywhere. And you're assuming that in the end, you're getting a federated model by averaging their weights. And that super fancy model works very badly with the averaging of weights because of the assumption of the model. That's not an adequate model for federated learning. Okay. So you would also like to have some sort of uh, uh, friendliness towards this distribution, or if not federation distribution, okay? You want a model that is able to learn without needing to have gradients sent here and there continuously, okay? Uh, with the heavy impact of communication. So, and that will, and this is the selling point, why I'm trying to sell reservoir computing in this context. Why is it interesting? Well, I already pointed this out, but almost everything in this pervasive intelligence scenario is a, is a time series because it's a measurement in time. Even everything that you have, the things that you take out of the sensors are measurements in time. The information that flows into the system is a measurement in time. We have seen that randomization is something that allows us to be computationally efficient because uh, we train less. If we're smart with the multiplication, we can do multiplicate. Uh, we can let's say wait more uh, in, in terms of computation. We have uh, another aspect which is sparse connectivity, which again uh, it's helpful for can be helpful, say, for computational efficiency, but it's also relevant for, um, for memory efficiency, okay? So our reservoir, this thing here, is very sparsely connected. If you're smart in your implementation, you can leverage that, but there is more to that. I mean, if you're smart in the way you do things, you don't need to store many weights. You just need to store few of them because of the, of the type of, uh, of model we have in front. So I'm coming back to this point and when I show you some, some examples. And oops. Uh, it has a simple readout training. So this helps from the perspective of having a simple training algorithm. We only train the readout. We are gonna be seeing today that it also helps for continual learning and it helps also in terms of federated learning because of the assumption of the model, which are particularly nice towards these settings. And in the end, I just in barely introduced it yesterday. We do have also this deep version, which allows you to scale to the, to the, to the cloud. Okay? So it's not that we only want to implement these models embedded. We want this model to be, uh, to be uh, you know, scalable also to, larger uh, to larger installments. And deep reservoir computing allows that. Okay, so you just stack very many reservoirs. Now, when you start designing these, these models, one thing you should be careful of, again, I come back to this uh, whole lot of uh, theoretical motivations, but you need to be careful about understanding what the model is doing. 
because you're going to be leveraging the properties of the model to optimize the model, especially when you're in a very constrained setting. You would like exactly to know what you can prove from what you can keep of the model without destroying the model ability to do what it's intended to do. Okay, so studying what are the properties of this uh, reservoir uh, from a theoretical perspective also gives insight on how you can implement it in a smart way. One thing that it's uh, uh, that it's first of all interesting to to add that, and that's an additional motivation, is the fact that for uh, how much it can seem a let's say a restricted model, it has sort of universal approximation capability. Okay, there are uh, works. Some of them are, Juan Pablo Ortega is one that works a lot on this kind of theoretical properties of reservoir computing. There are works that show you that uh, Ecostate networks, for instance, as an instance of a reservoir computing method can approximate any heavy memory filter. Okay. And, and this property holds for different settings. I mean, you, you can, of course, prove it for nonlinear reservoir plus linear readout, which is the setting that I've shown uh, yesterday. But this holds when you have a trigonometric uh, reservoir system plus uh, readout, but it also holds, and that's particularly interesting, when your reservoir is linear. You just have to have the readout being nonlinear. Okay? So that's, that's also another interesting aspect. And you can afford, actually, to have a linear reservoir. It's a dynamical system. Linear usually means, ah, I need to be careful because things explode and blow. But this is a contracted linear system. So things don't blow by design. So it's that's that's the key catch again. Let's get into uh, into these topics I again. I've got I've lost sight of my mobile, which I just used to avoid to go over time. So okay, okay. Let's start with the with the embedding. Okay. So we need design principles. If we want to have these systems uh, implemented in computing devices, which are constrained somehow, memory or computing wise, we need a way to optimize prune our reservoir. So what should we be focusing on? First of all, we should be focusing on what is the computation, the, the memory, what is called the memory capacity of the system. Again, we're talking about neural network, was key catch is that they can remember things about the past, so about past observations, and reuse it to predict in a, let's say, effective way on the present and on the future observations. So being very careful about their ability to remember the past is uh, essential, okay? If we lose that ability or if we reduce it too much, we're basically working with a feed forward network, which is not adequate for sequential data. Okay, so uh, there are studies that sort of uh, try to uh, formalize what is the capacity, the, the capacity of remembering things across time of these networks by studying their memory capacity. And I'm gonna be showing you uh, what this memory capacity is. And then characterize what kind of reservoirs have the maximum uh, memory capacity. What kind of reservoir has the best trade-off between complexity and uh, capacity of the, of the neural, uh, neural network. Using this design principle, we can design proper reservoirs. Another thing that, that is important, this one has been already introduced yesterday, is uh, characterizing the uh, operational regimes of these, uh, of these systems from the perspective of chaos theory. So of the, let's say, stability, okay, said in other words. How can we control their ability uh, to fast remember things or fast forget things? Because memory capacity is one thing. So that the possibility of entering a signal into the memory and that signal being preserved across time, that's memory capacity. But it's also important, the velocity of the memory. How fast you can erase or introduce things into memory, okay? And that's regulated by the stability. Because sometimes you don't always want a long memory, okay? If your task is a simple one and it only needs to look at the past few, uh, let's say, observations, you don't want a long memory because a long memory is counterproductive in this case, okay? When you're fast streaming and you're predicting the continuously, okay? 
So you want also to be able to control this aspect. And the other thing that, uh, that uh, I'm gonna be touching upon, talking about optimization of the memory is sort of breaking a little bit the assumption on which I built everything so that the reservoir is not a, is randomly initialized and never adapted. That's not true. I mean, it doesn't have to be like that, okay? So if I say something, always question it because it's not true that we always leave the reservoir as it is. There is a plenty of approaches that try also to make the reservoir adaptive. The, only, the key thing is that we want to make the, we want to avoid to make the reservoir adaptive by introducing back propagation, because that's the thing that doesn't work. That's the thing that is also a computational nightmare. Okay? You want some local learning mechanism. You want to be able to adapt your reservoir. Why? Because you want the impact of randomization, the impact of the fact that you threw, threw a, uh, you throw a dice and you came out with a certain number, that number is the number that you have in the weights of your system. You want to reduce the impact of randomness. Okay? You want to adjust a little bit that randomness to the specific characteristic of the data of your task. This typically calls for unsupervised learning approaches. And what I'm gonna be showing is an example of this uh, called intrinsic plasticity that comes from, bi uh, let's say, bio biological considerations, sort of. So let's start with the, with the short-term memory, okay? So with the, with the memory capacity of this, of this system. Okay, there is a study uh, that basically, uh, well, by one of the, uh, Abbott Jaeger has been one of the uh, author of the Ecostate Network. Okay, so it's one of the godfathers of the reservoir computing. And he has been studying the uh, memory of this system. So uh, how much they can remember things when you input them into their dynamical memory. And in order to do that, he has envisioned this uh, peculiar setting in which you basically have uh, uh, your reservoir system being inputted with, uh, with some inputs at time t, and that's not surprising. The thing that you're using is just uh, the trick is on the readout. On the readout, you're predicting uh, the input signal, but a, uh, let's say, a nulled input signal. Okay, so this one, this reservoir, this uh, readout here is predicting the input signal with a, a, a time t minus one, time t minus two. So you're going back into the past. Why are you doing that? Because you're trying to understand for how long a memory of the past can remain inside of this, of this reservoir in such a way that it can be reconstructed, okay? So you're fitting, X t minus three has entered at a certain point into the reservoir as an input. At time t, you're checking whether you still have a good resemblance of that, of that x of t minus three. And you have it um, up to, a, well, possibly infinity, of course not, a certain k delay, okay, maximum k delay. And then you compute memory capacity as actually how good you are at correlating uh, uh, this past signal with the uh, with its reconstructed version from extracted from the reservoir. Okay, at some point this thing will break. Okay, for a certain uh, value of k, this thing will break, will go down, and with that, you know, the memory capacity of your model is that k or k minus one before it broke. Okay, so that's how you use it, and that's uh, basically. One thing that shows you, these two pictures shows you the memory capacity, okay, how it goes for different reservoir units, for different choices, sorry, of the uh, uh, activation function of the reservoirs, okay? So this is also, again, hinting you at design principles. What is telling you here is that this is the delay, okay? What you have on the X axis is the delay. What you have on the Y axis is the memory capacity, so one is full memory capacity, okay? It's telling you that linear reservoirs work uh, better than nonlinear reservoirs in terms of memory capacity. This is not a hugely surprising result. It has come out other times in the current neural network processing, okay? Linear 
uh, linear units are nice at remembering things. The problem with linear units is that they tend to remember too many things. They are not selective, okay? And they tend to, of course, uh, let's say, explode unless you control them. But here they are naturally controlled because this linear system, dynamical system, these linear reservoir units are also contracted. So they have a convergent property, uh, let's say convergent behavior. So this thing here is telling you that if you want the longest memory capacity, you should be looking into linear reservoir units rather than nonlinear, surprisingly enough. If you want to keep uh, universal approximation capability, though that means that you need to change the readout. The readout needs to become uh, nonlinear rather than linear. Okay? And then it means that you need to train it by some iterative algorithm because you don't have close fold solution, okay, like in the, in the linear one. Uh, the interesting bit, uh, well, interesting and not surprising again, is that you obtain the maximal um, memory capacity for linear units with orthogonal weights, which again is not surprising. There's plenty of work in literature in the your or literature that introduce orthogonal weights also in general recurrent neural network because orthogonal weights, well, there's a simple theor theoretical motivation for the, for the fact that they are good also in, uh, in uh, recurrent neural net general recurrent neural networks. So orthogonal weights have, a, have a basically a spectral radius equal to one, okay? And, they, uh, and the weights are part of the, uh, of the long multiplication that you have in the back propagation. So if you have uh, something with a spectral radius one, you don't get a dampening effect to the, to the gradient. That's why we all like uh, uh, orthogonal weights. Problem with orthogonal weights is that if you're learning them, you need to orthogonalize continuously the weights if they are adaptive, which is a bloodbath computationally, if you do it every time. If you do it asymptotically, it just makes the problem worse from a learning, uh, learning perspective. Here, you don't have the problem because these weights are not learned, they are initialized. Again, it simplifies the uh, setting, okay, from a computational perspective. Uh, based on this, uh, let's say, intuition, people started reasoning upon what are the best topologies. Can we reason about the topologies of this reservoir which lead to the maximal, uh, to the maximal memory capacity, okay? Apart from, which activation function I use. Is there any topology that works better than, uh, than the others in terms of memory capacity? Well, it turns out that there are, and they are particularly interesting for embedding. There is a, uh, this paper here by Peter Tigno and Ali Rodan that studied what they call the uh, minimum complexity, complexity ecostate networks. They are basically, well, Reservoirs, you can see here, this is one particular example, which here doesn't show very nicely, but in the, in the next picture, I show it clearly. It's a, it's a loop, it's a, it's a circle, okay? In general, they prove that every reservoir, which is obtained by a permutation matrix, okay? Has the maximum uh, memory capacity. Uh, what does it mean? It means that you can, just to show it better, that if you need a decently large memory capacity, you should be opting for this kind of resonance, for instance. That's interesting, okay? Because you are restricting randomness now. In yesterday, I told you that it's all about randomness. Now I'm starting to tell you, you know what? It's not all about randomness. We can control that randomness because if we can control it, we can control, for instance, how, let's say, costly it is, the model selection, phase. Instead of searching for all the, uh, on the space of all possible sparse graphs that I can use to, to initialize my reservoir, I can focus on some structures, for instance, circles. Okay? Uh, this thing gets even more interesting because I can tell you that you can get maximum memory capacity if your weight matrix looks like this one. Do you see many weights? Many are zero. And the only thing that, that is not zero is W hat. So you have a reservoir which is made with a single weight. Okay. 
and that is maximum memory capacity. This is thing you can action when you implement things in truly strongly embedded environment. Okay. Clearly, what well, a uh, trick here is that you don't have all positive weights. You flip. You flip uh, the thing. You flip is positive the sign. Okay. So maybe same absolute value, but you flip the sign every now and then randomly. Okay. But that's the point. This thing here, which seems oversimplified, is actually an architecture that works nicely because it's good pro uh, memory. Okay. If your problem is about remembering things for quite some time, this is a good. Uh, this is a good, uh, let's say, design. And the length of the memory is more or less connected with the length of the circle. It's not surprising again. Okay, sort of related with that. So you need longer memory, make longer circles. Okay. Uh, here, let me just add the first additional bit of adaptation. Since we have simplified things very much, now all the neurons in this network, in this reservoir, sorry, are based on the same weight. So I'm very much simplifying. So I'm reducing a little bit the richness of the dynamics of these ne uh, ne uh, neurons. Can I recover a little bit of richness if I need it? Yes, you can modify, for instance, a little bit the way they activate and create this uh, gain modulated or uh, they have been called phase transition adaptive uh, net, uh, neurons in which, uh, well, this is the typical, uh, this is basically the calculation of the net input to the reservoir neurons, okay? Current input weight, uh, sorry, uh, past reservoir activation, the only weight that you have, current input, the weight for the input. Now, this net before being applied to the tan age, is modulated by A. This is how this, this weird symbol here is just element wise multiplication. Okay. So this is a vector, same size as this. Okay. The size of the thing in between brackets here is the number of neurons that you add in the reservoir. Okay. So you're modulating each sort of the internal activation of each neuron by A. Okay. And A is called the gain because it can switch off or switch on amplify, well, typically switches off because it's a, it's a value between zero and one. It controls how much internally active are each neuron, okay? And this is a learned thing, okay? And this is a bias, which again is a vector that is as big as this thing here. So that moves the uh, baseline activation level of the single neurons. And again, this is learned, okay? And you can learn these two things Why I'm introducing them because this gain and this bias, you can learn them through local rules, okay? So you don't need to backpropagate, you don't need ground truth information, you don't need supervision to update those, which is good because we're talking about embedded implementations. You want your model to be faithful to the distribution of the data that is receiving in input, to be good for the distribution of the data, to adapt to the distribution of the data it is receiving, okay? Because that might be fluctuation. You might want it, you want it to be effective, even if there are slight changes in the distribution of the sensor information that comes in. Okay, that's the thing that you gain. And in order to gain this, you don't want to introduce strong supervision because otherwise you need somebody to keep labeling your time series and you don't have it as such in a distributed environment. You might have it, but it's really seldom that you got this supervised feedback. Okay. Then, if you want to put the... Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so what is the difference between A and B here? Isn't B uh, including A to... Oh, the B. The, the, the weights this two. from X to R. Uh, so... Uh, yeah, after the B. This W and this W hat, so you mean? E, e, capital uh, B. Capital uh, B. After from, the, from the, 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 the... Oh, oh yeah, sorry, sorry. This is the readout. These are the readout weights. Sorry, I didn't so this explain is after this. After 10H, right? This is after 10H. This is basically the weights that you use to combine the activation of the, the X of T, basically. Okay. So uh, Y of T is equal to V times X of T. So, so this is the readout. So do we really need A when we have a weighting like readout? It's different. These are the weights that you adapt by supervised learning to be effective 
and precise in predicting exactly what you need in output from the network. A and B are two things that regulate the level of activation of the neurons in response to the inputs. It's not connected with the task you're solving. It's rather connected with the distribution of activations of your neuron. You want to use A and B, for instance, to diversify um, a little bit to what the, the, these neurons here respond to. Why do you want to do that? Because you have restricted very much the dynamicity. So what you have done here is uh, say, you started from the intuition, I want something that is very long memory and possibly as simple as possible in terms of topology. And I tell you, this is the best. It's a circle thing with a single weight, maximum memory capacity. I'm happy. Well, that's only one dimension because memory capacity is one dimension. Richness of the dynamics of this simple linear system is another thing you want. And you are sacrificing it very much with this structure. So what you can do to recover a little bit of that richness, you introduce these two guys here to push the different neurons to have different baseline activations, for instance, or to have different, uh, let's say, fastness of response to the game. Okay, it, it's a way of reintroducing a little bit of richness in a very constrained system. And how do you learn that? Uh, this particular, uh, the, all the, 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 there is a paper, if you search uh, phase transition adaptation, you'll find it. But the intuition is that you learn them to obtain uh, some specific property in terms of the lacuna of uh, stability of this thing here. So it's, it's totally local to the reservoir and it's bound to the stability. Again, if you remember from a couple of uh, slides before, I told you that one thing is memory capacity, the other thing is richness of dynamics. Richness of the dynamics is bound to the stability of the dynamical system. So you learn this thing so that it has some certain, it leads to certain high uh, uh, exponents, for instance, in this, in this system. So you don't really need to touch on the, on the let's say, um, on the task, just on the dynamics of the system. I don't know, it's a partly unsurprising thing, but if we enter that thing, we can stay there for like 20 minutes and then, sorry. Okay, as soon as we put the, the uh, circles at the center of our, uh, of our target, we then start, can start reasoning on working on them and putting them on steroids. And so things you can find are, for instance, these kind of architectures in which you can see it's plenty of circles, okay? With the, so you have a certain number of circles. Each circle has its own uh, peculiar weight, okay? So each reservoir is a, its own peculiar weight and each circle has a different length. And then you have connections between the circles which are called jump connections, okay? Why, what's the rationale of this design? The rationale of this design is that what you can, I mean, let's start intuitively, is that you can have a memory made of multiple memories, each one is a different length, each one is allowed to have a different speed, because the speed of the memory is connected with the stability, the stability is connected with the spectral radius of the weights, the spectral radius of the weights is basically connected with how you choose the W parameter for each of the circles, okay? And then you have jump connections because you're allowed to, let's say, uh, some faster or slower memory to influence the other. Okay, that's what, what they are there for. Then if you start looking into actually how things, how things work, well, it's not surprising if you study the eigenvalues of this, uh, of this reservoir here, so all, of all the uh, weights in this reservoir, they are organized in this way in which you can see that they are concentric uh, with the, let's say, uh, the, the colors are corresponding to the colors that you see here, okay? So you have a way of controlling with these uh, sort of topologies, the memory length by having longer circles and with the weights of the, uh, of the, of the cycles, you control the speed of the memory, which you can see also pictured in, the, in this particular, uh, 
let's say, representation of the eigenvalues, okay? And yeah, where again, let's say larger radius means that this is closer to the edge of stability, uh, to the edge of chaos, okay? Spectral radius closer to one is closer to the, to the edge of chaos. So it's faster memory. Yeah. What's the difference between centric and stack? That's a good point. Uh, not much. This is actually a version of the of the stack. This came before the depressive work of use. So it was a it was built before, uh, let's say, people started reasoning about the reservoir, which is a more general context uh, concept. But honestly speaking, there is not an incredible difference. I mean, maybe a little bit because in uh, let's say deep reservoir you have uh, the concept of one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, let's say full connectivity between uh, stacks okay so if you want to picture this as a deep reservoir you would expect to have full connectivity from for instance the outer circle to the second inner circle here also connectivity in, uh, between reservoirs is false that's sort of the subject but i mean I would include it into the possible stacked architecture. It's just that it's a very specific stacked architecture, which is also an interpretation as a monolithic architecture because it can also be interpreted as a full reservoir because this you know, sparse connectivity allows it to. Thank you. Time? Okay. Uh, all in all, for saying that in the end, we played a little bit with this stuff, okay? Yeah, across the years, and we started playing around with this, uh, with these models in uh, distributed compute, uh, let's say, distributed pervasive intelligence environment back in 2011, okay? Some of you weren't born yet, but uh, it was 2011, and it was part of this project here, which was called Rubicon, it was Framework Program 7 still, uh, and the technology was different at the time. Uh, what we did there is we created this, um, this system, which was a distributed learning system, actually, uh, that could embed these reservoir computing models, both on, you know, PC-like stuff, something that cannot be defined embedded, okay? on robots, also on nasty little bastards, sorry for the technical definition, but I've sweared a lot on those guys there, which are like tiny OS moat-like stuff, okay? Moat sensor. Just for you to picture the thing, uh, these guys here have an onboard memory of eight kilobytes. The thing was running the tiny OS operating system and our neural networks and the learning algorithm for the neural networks. How do you get this thing to work into such a crazy environment? You apply the concept that we've seen before. We have used simplified reservoir, uh, reservoir uh, topologies, single, uh, not single weights. We reduced the, uh, uh, the weights to a, a discrete alphabet of like five to 10 possible weights. Uh, with uh, basically no mathematical support. So all your weights were like discrete, discrete heavily discretized weights. We know uh, support for inversion of matrices. So you need to work a little bit on your, on your uh, let's say learning model, learning algorithm to do that, but you can, okay? The thing was working. The nasty part was debugging these guys by looking at, oh yeah, I saw it, I saw it, I, I saw a red flashing light. No, it was a green one. I saw uh, a sequence of a green and a blue and a red. Do you remember what was that? It felt like the, the uh, 1950s in which people were debugging uh, systems with the punched, punched cards, okay? It was really a travel back in time. Never do it, okay? If you want to suggest it. But it's interesting to see how this stuff uh, actually can really be implemented and really works even when you push them. Does it really work? Well, actually, well, uh, are you, okay. It has also music, I forgot about that. Uh, one thing that uh, I wanted to pinpoint, it was 
2011, but this system was actually able to manage the full distributed system and as and that sort of an over the air uh, management uh, the, uh, a system for over the air deployment of neural networks. So it was able to deploy uh, on the fly neural networks on all the modes and receive back the models when they were updated locally and update a repository of all the models that you had. We weren't working on, res on federated learning at the time because it wasn't yet a concept, but uh, was sort of, uh, it had some nice intuition. Okay. And we used it for this thing. Okay, okay that's, that's possibly, that can be possibly avoided. Okay. This is showing you what kind of things we were doing with it. The, what you're seeing there is a classical trolley robot for, for hospital that was navigating an actual hospital. That's an actual hospital for children in, in Pisa, it's called Stella Maris. And the thing was traveling on the, uh, on the corridors and it was self-localizing itself by receiving signal strength where the position on the map was predicted by a reservoir computing neural network. So, figure out a uh, reservoir computing neural network receiving an input for each of the anchors that you have around. One input, which is the receiver signal strength at the time and predicting an output X, Y position on your map. Basically that's, that's the thing, okay? And we managed to reach, I mean, in this kind of settings, you can get to uh, precisions that are around, let's say, between 30 and 50 centimeters, which are decent for navigating these robots in these environments, okay? And yeah, I mean, and they were running on that system that I showed before. So this, this thing here as, oh, sorry. This thing here as you can see a mode on the top where the neural network is run and communicating with the, it's, it's depicted here. You can just see the, the antenna. And there were others distributed over there. And you can imagine the, the nicety of the system of, of, of the setting because a lot of reflection, a lot of uh, uh, let's say metallic stuff here and there, people passing by. So it's it's uh, it's something that you can get to be quite robust. Uh, the, old, the 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 thing was also deployed in a sort of a ambient assistant leading setting uh, with uh, with robots that were supposed to be supporting somebody with. Uh, uh, in their daily lives. And again, here we were applying the concepts of uh, creating uh, virtual sensors out of, uh, of um, say, uh, physical sensors. So this whole house was sensorized with very dumb sensors, like open close sensors or pressure sensors, nothing really, really particularly fancy. Uh, the person wasn't sensorized at the time, so only, only the environment. And the, the thing was actually, and this is basically the map of the, of the environment. And the thing was basically using this distributed the neural network to predict events about what are the current activity being performed by the user. Uh, the, the, the whole thing had also on the top of everything, some cognitive system that was discovering whether new activities were being performed. It, it was a bit of an articulated system. But reservoir computing was used specifically to recognize <laughs> Uh, what activities the user was doing based on the sequence of sensors that were active uh, at the time. And this is from another project in which instead we use these models to create, uh, to change the way you use devices, okay? That's clearly a balance board, okay? The we balance board. So we, um, <clears throat> We operated on a, uh, on a Wii balance, uh, on the Wii balance board to, uh, to collect, uh, basically we read the four stork signals that you have here on the, on the balance board. It's like, I don't remember, it's, it's four or eight, something from four or eight sensors, but anyway, it's not really relevant. These are fed into a reservoir computing model, an ecostate network. What's the job of this thing? This thing has been changed into sort of a medical device which can estimate what is called the Berg balance score. The Berg balance scale is a, is a, and it's used to determine what's the level of, uh, let's say, equilibrium or of a, of a person. 
is typically used for people who have suffered some sort of injury to the brain or to other people. Okay. This requires, when, the, when it's done by, by a clinician, it requires the execution of a certain number of equilibrium exercises, which I'm not showing because you might score me low on that. Uh, uh, that lasts some 10 minutes, okay? 10 minutes is long. For somebody who has suffered injuries, is long. So what we did is we picked up all these exercises, we studied them from, uh, from the perspective of a predictive model, and we came out with a single exercise of length of 10 seconds, using that uh, the readings of the sensor board on those 10 seconds of a person executing that exercise, we can get a, uh, an estimate of the bad balance scale, which is as accurate as that of an other clinician. It means that the level of discrepancy is the same that, that exists between two different clinicians doing exactly the same, uh, the same assessment. Okay, and you get it down from 10 minutes to 10 seconds, okay, just by transforming this device for playing into something that, uh, that is, uh, sense, uh, let's say, that has some intelligence in it. Okay, uh, can we get this embedding thing on steroids? I'll do this thing very quickly and then I give you a break, okay, don't worry. Can we get it uh, more embedded than, uh, than it is? Yes, we can make it neuromorphic, which sounds very like a, a you know, sci-fi movie from the 70s, but it's actually a research field. Uh, what's the key catch? The key catch is that I've been beating around this thing for a little bit. My reservoir is a dynamical system. Okay, is an input-driven dynamical system. It's actually something different. It's more than that. It's a very many little dynamical system, one attached to the other, because it's sparsely connected neurons. But overall, you can consider it as an input-driven dynamical system. Then here is the point. If this is an input-driven dynamical system implemented with some code, can we create can we attach it and put in place of the uh, this coded uh, input-driven dynamical system another dynamical system? The answer is of course yes, provided that it has the same properties. Okay, so richness of dynamics and so on, and controllable dynamics. So <clears throat> uh, this is already from yesterday. So that's uh, that has inspired a full line of research which has to do with physical reservoir computing in which the reservoir, of course, depending on, uh, on, on the physical reservoir, you can also make physical, so the readout, but in particular, making the reservoir physical, okay? Really implemented using the laws of physics. What does it mean in practice? Uh, well, this is a, this is a uh, if you're interested, this is a good survey paper, okay? It means that, for instance, you can implement it using memory stores, okay? Where you can use conductances as weights. You can use Ohm's law to, uh, to, to have multiplication of weights for inputs. And then you can use Kirchhoff to compute the outputs, okay? And there is a certain number of of these uh, works around. Uh, well, memory stores are nice, are cheap, they have a big problem when you're working with resistance, currents tends to flow everywhere. So if you want to implement, you know, sparsely connected stuff, separated things, you need to modularize a lot. You need a lot of models. You need to stack things because otherwise if you connect stuff and you can compute on current, current goes where you can, of course. Okay. Then there is Spintronics. So you have magnetic nano neurons that communicate with uh, radio waves, okay? Synapses are implemented through radio waves in this particular case. You don't even need to have, uh, let's say, physical contact apart from the radio waves. Photonics, this is a huge, uh, huge area. There is actually, there exists already a company which is called Lighton, I think is French. They are already selling photonic devices. You can buy them. Okay? And they implement uh, reservoirs using Light, of course, okay? And the, your flowing information is light and neurons are just optical resonators. 
uh, can we do worse? Yes, we can create uh, an actual physical body, which is made of uh, masses connected by, by spring systems. That's a dynamical system. You can control it. You can use it to compute. Okay. And actually, there is, if you want one example, there is a, this guy here, which is a crazy, uh, crazy guy, which actually implements reservoir computing through a, uh, a robot. I don't know whether you're familiar with soft robots. Soft robots like octopus. Octopuses are classical example of animals that when you transform them into robots, they become soft robots. They're made of a certain number of tiny equators, a lot of tiny equators connected by, by, uh, by some, uh, let's say, uh, spring system. And in fact, they can be described by this kind of system, okay, spring mass systems. And this guy is basically putting these uh, octopus arms into water and using their dynamics as a reservoir to compute things that you would compute with a neural network. I mean, this is, of course, pushing things to the limit and it, uh, it's, it's more, let's say, a challenge, but there is some interesting aspects in there. The fact that really anything which has a dynamical system nature that you can control, you can use it. There are people that are, of course, implementing reservoir computing with biological tissue, okay? You can use uh, neuron cultures as reservoirs and then readouts with, uh, with the electrical current. Uh, we are actually pushing this, this concept a little bit further and then I stop uh, for a while at least in a, in a project that we, we are starting in, um, in October that I'm gonna, that I'm coordinating. And there we are reasoning on the fact that actually there is this, this physical nature of, of reservoirs, that reservoirs are physical, are dynamical systems, that bodies of robots are dynamical systems. Bodies of robots, in the end, what they do is they transform, they interact with the environment, they transform what they perceive from the environment into some information. What, what uh, neural networks do is they sense information that is fed in input, they transform it into something different. So possibly body and, and neurons are not very much different from one another. So the thing that we are trying to investigate is whether we can formalize both with the same language and say, can we create a uh, new formalism for neural networks as well as for physical systems that describe their let's say, ability to transform information in terms of dynamical system, in terms of a set, a vocabulary of very simple dynamical systems, which we call the archety archetypal units. Those are just controllable, simple dynamical systems, plus operators that connect them. And then if you, if you manage to do that, you can create a single language that you can use to, uh, let's say, describe and implement also mixed physical neural systems. Okay. In particular, what we are going to be working on is soft robotics and, and also swarms, swarms, swarms of robots, because the idea here, well, this is part of a larger, uh, this is a bit of a larger uh, prog research program in which we are studying awareness. So the consciousness of things, the consciousness of robots, the consciousness of very simple things, even tiny little dynamical system might have consciousness or not. And so this is part of the engineering effort. There is ethicists in it, physics, uh, you know, philosophy, people from philosophy of mind. If you're interested in that, that's the consortium and we're starting in, in October, just come, uh, come, come search for me. Let's stop here. So let me start the concluding bits of this, of this talk. It's just 20 slides in 20 minutes, one slide at a minute. Fantastic. I'm going to be compressing, OK? Uh, first, first thing, I promise you embedded, I promise you continual. Embedded, I, I served a part of it. Uh, let's, let's see continual, OK? I probably can skip this thing because uh, Vincenzo of Monaco might have already uh, delivered enough information about it but let's let's just very be very quick what is continual learning continual learning is about the ability to to learn continuously okay through throughout the lifetime of a of a, of a learning agent 
but without forgetting. That's the key point of continuum learning. Okay, so you want to be able to receive your data as batches of experience that come at whatever times they come, learn from them. And every time you get a new experience, learn from this new experience, add skills to your skill set without forgetting the skills that you learned from before. That's the, the whole concept, okay? So, and without keeping the information from the past, because that's not efficient. That's not how we work. We as human keep adding skills to our skill set with a decent level of forgetting, not, not very much. It's not that because we learn to drink, we forget how to eat. Okay? And we don't have to keep videos of how you should, of how you eat in order to remember how to eat. Okay. So you don't want to call uh, to keep data as, uh, or to keep as little possible data. Uh, as little data as possible in order to do this continual adaptation. Okay, so learn from your experience, possibly exploiting positive forward transfer means possibly leveraging what you already know to add a new skill and know, and then avoid mitigate catastrophic forgetting. So avoid negative backward transfer. So things that you learn here that affect, interfere with things that you knew from before. Now, why reservoir computing is interesting in this context? Well, first of all, you can't forget if you're not changing. The reservoir is not changing, so you can't forget anything. And that's a good first starting point. The second thing is there is no recurrent parameters to learn, and believe me, that's, that changes things. Okay, Much of the things that you find around with continual learning, it's fantastic, beautiful, amazing, it has been thought for fit forward models. If you apply them to recurrent neural networks, it doesn't work. Because recurrent neural networks have different assumptions that can fit forward ones. And those nasty assumptions change the thing. Okay. Uh, so we can apply these continual learning strategies on the only trainable parameters that we have in our. Uh, reservoir computing model, which are fee forward. So the standard strategy might work. Okay. And well, this, this additional point is very specific to the solution that, uh, that we have, uh, let's say, started to explore, that you can consider the reservoir, the untrained components, as a pre-trained network. Why? Because there are a certain number of works in literature about continual learning that has been developed specifically assuming that your network has a pre-trained part and another part which is adaptive, okay, which is fit forward. And so what we uh, did here it was basically this is just an assessment of different strategies on reservoir computing. Right? That's what we did. It's, it's preliminary work. Uh, we assess the classical elastic weight consolidation. Uh, elastic weight consolidation is one of those uh, of those strategies that tend not to work when you apply them to recurrent neural network. Okay, why? Because the way they they the assumption that is underlying the elastic weight consolidation is that you can treat parameters as independent. This is not true for recurrent neural networks because there is cyclic dependencies. So the assumptions they have underlying the the model are falsified. We are applied uh, to the, res the, the reservoir computing. We can apply to reservoir computing because the trainable parameters are fit forward. So we're still in a condition in which these things work. We have used learning without forgetting, which is another way of, again, is based on regularization. Probably uh, Vincenzo already told uh, to you, this th thing sort of keeps a copy of your, of your parameters and make sure that you're not diverging too much from those. So you penalize where you diverge a little, uh, a little too much from the old version of your parameters. Uh, then there is replay, which is all in all the thing that typically works better than, than the rest, because you basically either store a some samples from the past or some gradients from the past, or in, in a way or in another, you're storing information from the past. Then the trick is to store as little data as possible, because that goes against the law in, uh, in continual learning. The thing that you can do with the reservoir computing is also apply streaming LDA. LDA is linear discriminant analysis. Streaming is the incremental version of a linear discriminant analysis. This has been proposed as a 
specifically as a, let's say, continual learning algorithm for pre-trained networks in which you have a part of the network which has been trained by somebody like Google, Facebook, or Meta, whatever, Amazon, just to say a few of them because you cannot afford the algorithm to do that. Uh, and what you do is only fine tuning of the final bits of the final layers of the network. Okay, if you want to, if you're in that setting and you're only fine tuning, you might use this kind of approach here because you have a big pre-trained bit that doesn't change and you want to focus only on the final bits and change that. And uh, this is not different from what you have in a reservoir computer scenario because you have a pre-trained network, which is particularly dumbly pre-trained, it's just randomly generated, but it's not changing, so it's good. And the readout is implemented with the, with the streaming LDA. So basically what you have there is that you have a mean parameter for each of the classes. This is for class uh, for classification problem and the shared covariance matrix between, uh, between these elements. And yeah, you basically have an LDA component that tells you uh, which, uh, let's say, that tells you how to update things depending on whether they can be projected in the mean parameters of one class or the other. So uh, if you play a little bit with this, just, just to see if it does work, these are, yeah, simple sequential uh, benchmarks. What you can see is that uh, we, we've been com comparing long short term memories with uh, with echo state networks. Well, first thing you can see clearly that uh, EWC doesn't work okay, with recurrent networks. Well, actually, it doesn't work even with echo state networks. It doesn't work, full stop, for some reason. Uh, the interesting bit is that, of course, replay works nicely. What you can see is that if you use a strategy such as streaming LDA, which you cannot use with LSTM because everything is adaptive with LSTM, but uh, with Echo State Network, you can get good results uh, in, uh, in continual learning settings, which are comparable with, uh, with the replay in long short term memory. Not always, here is, is still decent, but, uh, but far from this one. Okay? Again, this is just really preliminary results, but the idea was to show you that you can build on the assumption of the reservoir computing model to have also continual learning mechanism that work, uh, that work nicely on recurrent learning, which is not typically the case unless you use replay. Uh, oh, this is advertisement to WeChat. So, okay, now this is uh, probably made with Avalanche from Continual AI, our library for continual learning. So check it out. Uh, I'm speeding up because I want just to, to uh, conclude uh, the presentation and leave you enough time for questions if you have. Apart from continual, can we also exploit some property of reservoir computing in federated learning? So uh, the setting, okay, very quickly also because probably you're familiar also with this setting. The federated learning setting is a setting in which you have a different devices spread around the world, but belonging to different people. And on those devices, on those installations, even just installation maybe be more, more devices, what you have is basically a personalized model for each installation, okay? And uh, for some sort of reason, and that sort of reason can be, again, the European Communion with a big a community with a big stick that doesn't want you to, you cannot share the data between installations. So data is private to the single installation. You can feed a model locally to the, to the installation, but you cannot share the data to the cloud to have a centralized model, okay? So what you're allowed to, to share is only the model, okay? The data, you cannot. And how can I obtain uh, the best performing centralized model, which take into consideration possibly the experience available in all the different installations, but without sharing the experiences, only sharing the, the, uh, the models, okay? That's basically about federated learning. Uh, what uh, we would like uh, to, to see in particular with the use of reservoir computing is whether we can leverage the properties of the neural of, of our very restricted neural networks to make this federated uh, learning process more effective okay? or cheaper cheaper we can we don't we didn't focus on making it cheaper but we focus it on making it let's say uh, more effective 
Now, uh, how does it work? Well, basically, consider that we have this setting here, okay? In which we have uh, each of these green thing is a, oh, sorry, each of these is class, is a reservoir computing model, okay? Available in one particular installation where it can be trained, okay? So this thing here has been trained on some data. This thing here is being trained on some other data different from this one. Uh, maybe is trained by the continual learning mechanism that we have seen before. And then there is the cloud in which I want to create a master, uh, a master model, which includes the information available from all the clients, okay? So the thing that uh, we can reason on is that if we make an assumption which is a at the currently is a strong assumption, but it's it's an assumption on which we're building right now. We're gonna be, let's say, removing parts of it, but let's let's build on this. Let's assume that these models have the same reservoir. Okay. It's okay. Same reservoir. It's not adapted, it's not data specific. Okay. This model has the same reservoir. If everybody has the same reservoir, then we are in condition to perform centralized learning, which is exact, okay? Why? Because basically we can transfer some information from all these readouts, only from the readouts that can be combined in the centralized model, such a way that the centralized model is the exact equivalent of having all the data on which you have trained the single models available on the cloud. How do you do that? Well, you look at how you learn the reservoir. This is how you learn the reservoir. It's ridge regression, okay? This is the weight, uh, sorry, the, the reservoir, the readout. W are the weights of the readout, okay? When you learn those, you learn those by multiplying the states from the reservoir for, for the targets, and this is the, 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 the weights of the reservoir. This is the, uh, let's say, the ridge regression parameter or the regularization parameters. This is how you learn the readout, okay? This is how you will learn all this readout. This is why you, how in principle you will learn this readout here, if you're allowed to transfer the data. Now, you can look at this and realize that there are two components in it. This multiplication here and this multiplication here. So what you can do is compute this first bit here which is the multiplication of the targets and the states for a specific client, okay? So this client here computes this value here. This client, the same client also computes this other value here, which is this other bit here, okay? So all the clients keep these statistics here. And you can keep these statistics here, you don't need to keep the data in order to compute it. You can compute it incrementally, okay? As new data arrives, you just update it. So it's something that, it's a statistic that you can keep here and update it as new data comes in. What you can do then is transfer this data to the, uh, to the uh, federated, uh, to the central model. The central model will aggregate it with this thing, with this formula here. And this is just algebra. These two things are absolutely identical, okay? Why this is interesting? Because in federated learning, typically what you do is you take strong simplifying assumption on how you aggregate things on the cloud. You typically work under the assumption that you can sort of average the ways that come from the client under different distributions. You can be very creative about the weighting distributions, but you're basically obtaining things as an average, as an approximation of what you would obtain if you could transfer the data. In this particular case, you can really get exactly the, the same result as if you had all the data available. Again, what you do, you just leverage the model that you have, okay? And well, this is just to prove that if you actually do it, numbers are done, okay? So this is basically uh, a centralized ESM, okay? For different percentages of training subjects. So this means is a, uh, this is a, let's say, based on a, on a benchmark, which is about uh, human stress recognition. Okay, so there's multiple people each wearing uh, some wearables that measure galvanic skin response, heartbeat, stuff like that. So 
everybody is owner of his own data. And this is what happens uh, for different percentages uh, of uh, training subjects being available, okay? The test set remains stable. So you're testing on a, on a stable test set and you're just seeing what, uh, what happens when you add additional experiences. So more, more people to your, uh, to your federated setting. And what you can see is that uh, a centralized DSM, so that has access to all the data, as if it were centralized somewhere, has exactly the same values of accuracy as the incrementally trained federated ecosystem. Why? Because it's trivially the same thing. Okay. And this is just to show what's the difference when you instead average weights. Okay. If you apply classical weight averaging, you can see that there is a substantial difference, especially when you are in the, let's say, low regime of data. Of course, provided that you have enough data as usual, average will, will converge to what you expect, which is expectation. Okay, uh, but, but this is so too supervised. Can I really expect that all my federated installments can uh, train on unsupervised data? In some cases, it's reasonable to assume that your federated setting is a federated setting in which each client sort of for some magic collects supervised targets to update locally the model. But yeah, this is a bit of a stretch, okay? In some cases, you might instead think, yeah, you know what? I can expect things to be adapted locally, but maybe this adaptation is not supervisedly driven. It's just an adaptation of the model to some specific behavior, to some dynamicity, to some environmental factors. So can I obtain that tiny level of adaptation, that targeting of my, of my system to the specific installation in an unsupervised manner? Yes, of course, because you can resort to things that are non, uh, let's say, uh, uh, supervised, such as a, a concept of homeostatic plasticity. Homeostatic plasticity is a biological concept. Uh, well, it's a, it's a mechanism, it's a phenomenon that allows neurons to adapt their firing rates, basically. So can we, here the question is, can we adapt the firing rates of our reservoir? Again, I'm breaking a little bit the initial assumption and saying, you know what? Instead of operating in a fully randomized setting, I build on a randomized concept, but I'm telling you, you know what? The reservoir, after being initialized in a randomized way with a proper all the proper, uh, let's say, theoretical property that it has to have, I'm allowing it a little bit of flexibility in order to diversify, create richer, uh, richer dynamics in the, in the reservoir, create a dynamics that are more consistent with the data that the reservoir is seeing in input, not in output. I don't care about the output because that will require knowing targets, okay? Only adapted to the dynamicity of the data. That's what intrinsic plasticity is about. So what you're going to be doing is again, play a little bit with, uh, with gains and biases. <clears throat> so this is the classical, uh, say, cumulative input of a reservoir neuron, okay? So it's just the weighted inputs to a reservoir neuron. Part of it comes from, from the activation of the reservoir from the past, part comes from the input, okay, currently. What I'm doing is, again, I'm adding my gain and bias, okay? These two magic uh, quantities that regulate how, uh, that dampen uh, the, the response, this, this uh, cumulative input that shifts a little bit the average activation, the bias. And I'm learning the gain and bias, again, instead of using the trick about Lyapin of uh, uh, exponents, here, I'm using intrinsic plasticity. The concept here is that I'm changing the gain and the bias to make sure that the activation pattern, the distribution of the activation of my neurons, okay, matches that of an exponential distribution. Why is that? Because you have maximum entropy when you match uh, the, the distribution of an exponential distribution, which means high richness, okay? You don't need a target there. I mean, a target meaning uh, ground truth information about the task. You just need to your the outputs of your neuron to match in distribution 
a generic exponential distribution. Well, rather than generic, you pick up one, you know, well, the Gaussian, the normal, actually, okay? So you match the distribution of your neurons in the reservoir with a Gaussian distribution. You can pick up other, other distribution from the exponential center, whatever, okay? But Gaussian typically works, okay? Zero, zero centered with a sigma that you can pick up in model selection, for instance, but zero centered. And then, well, basically, the rules of the intrinsic plasticity just come out from, uh, from the gradient that you can get by uh, minimizing the Kubak library divergence between the distribution of your neural network outputs and the Gaussian. And the Kubak library is a nested beast, but for Gaussians, it's easy to compute. Okay. Gaussian stuff is easy to compute. And so you get these update rules for the bias and gain, and you use them. So whenever your reservoir computing system is operating locally, is receiving an input data that is local to the installment, it will have some activation patterns, okay? You will make sure that those activation patterns specific for that particular setup in that particular house for that particular user are not much different than a, than a Gaussian, okay? And for the different users, you get different uh, gains and biases, basically. So the federated setting that you have this time is a federated setting in which you have different users and you have for the different users or different settings, you have different gains and, 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 uh, and biases, sorry. Uh, I forgot to change the gain for, for, the different, for the different clients, Never mind. And then what you do is you allow them to let's say adapt independently. So each reservoir will get adapted to a specific user. And then you allow to transmit the gains and the biases to the, to the central server. And then you learn uh, a centralized gain and a centralized uh, uh, bias by averaging actually in this case, okay? You average over the, uh, the, the information they get. As soon as you've done that, Okay, you communicated it, you send it back. Okay, you send it back, and everybody else might be using the new value and then re adapt it again and go ahead. Okay, does it work? Well, it does work actually pretty nicely. What you can see here is a, is a comparison between the incremental, uh, the incremental federated learning from the previous slide, the exact one that I showed, the supervised one, and what you obtain if instead of having the incremental. Uh, supervised adaptation, you allow unsupervised adaptation, okay? And you can get nice uh, results in which you can see that having reservoirs of richer, let's say, dynamics uh, leads you to even better uh, results in, also in terms of supervised. That's uh, more or less the catch. I'm closing, no worries, getting down to the point in which I try to say that all this stuff can be packaged into, or ideally one would like to package all this stuff, all these different learning models of these different learning algorithms into one thing and then make it available for people that wants to develop applications. And that's one thing that we are doing as part of it. This is a okay, advertisement, advertisement time. It's, it's a part of a European project that uh, I'm coordinating, which is uh, an H2020 project, which is closing next year. It's called Teaching. This project has uh, a vision, which is a vision uh, which is quite consistent, I believe, with the, with the, with the topics of this, uh, of this summer school, because we talk about cyber-physical system of systems. So it is basically, distributed computing system on steroids, okay? So heavily diverse devices uh, distributed into an environment connected with the cloud, with the edge sensors, whatever you can think of, okay? The idea of this project is to re recognize the fact that if you are a developer, you want to develop applications that run on the cyber physical systems of systems, you would like to have some sort of uh, properties uh, well, some sort of support in, uh, in developing these applications. And in particular, what the kind of support you would like to have has to do with the fact that when we are discussing about some physical system, we have two things, cyber and physical, okay? Physical means that these systems are in the real world. 
it means also that most of the time they have an effect on the real world. In the real world, there are humans, okay? So you might want good effect on the real world because that's good effect on humans as well. Okay, so the, the, the project is about recognizing that at the center of this cyber physical system, subject to the decision of these applications, there is a human, okay? And uh, maybe, well, at least, that's, that's the vision. So these applications are performing autonomous, uh, things autonomous or operating autonomously. So whenever we have such application in a distributed environment that can operate, that can have an effect on a, on a people, you would like those applications, first of all, to be adapted because humans are unpredictable, physical environments are unstructured and so on. You want them to operate synergistically with the human. You don't want them to be adversary of the human, to do things that the human doesn't like, or that it's being subjected to things that are creating some issues. Let's be practical, okay? What is the scenario? Autonomous cars, autonomous driving cars, or even if not autonomous, with some level of, of autonomy, okay? You don't want the car to drive the way the car likes. You want the car to drive the way the, the person that are inside the car uh, feel that is good to be driven. Okay, so you need to keep the human factor into consideration. When you're doing this stuff, you want your system to be dependable. Okay, you want your autonomous driving application to be something that doesn't mess up to keep people stuck believing that a stop sign is a uh, is a full speed sign. You want them to be efficient because you're distributed, battery operated, uh, many things. And you want them to be secure because otherwise somebody acts and it kills you, whatever. So in order to deal with that, we basically are proposing a sort of a package of things from dependability engineering to uh, software programming libraries that deliver concepts of uh, adaptive, uh, adaptive systems, secure, artificial intelligence and so on, that builds heavily on what we have seen today, okay? The kind of setting we are, we are dealing with is that really we do have cars with, uh, and with people in it, with people who are sensorized, we are gathering feedback from people as they've been driven around and we're using the feedback, the psychological, cognitive, emotional feedback of people inferred from sensors, gas with what, reservoir computing models, to generate a feedback signal, so a training signal for the autonomous application. So the autonomous applications learns to behave better, where better means creating less uh, uh, cognitive overload on the user. Okay, think about another environment, a plant where you have robots, robots working with humans. Okay. You don't want the robot to work at the speed that is good for the robot. You want the robot to work at the speed that is good for the human when you're operating in this mix of environment. Okay. So what you're trying to get here is a full system that can uh, enable this application to know how the human is, is, is feeling. And the human doesn't have to tell with buttons to the system, stop doing this. Is the system that is inferring how the human is feeling and how the human is uh, is operating and changes its, its operation basically, and it's indeed something that is very much a federated thing in which you have multiple installments, multiple cars, or multiple whatever. What we are building as part of that is what is called an AI as a service system, which is basically an infrastructure that allows you to uh, create these intelligent applications. So basically what we are providing is, a, is an abstraction, okay? You want to develop an application that uses learning systems that can be deployed in a distributed environment, that can be trained continuously, that can be federated, that can be intrinsic, uh, that can be, let's say, adapted with intrinsic plasticity. Well, we do have this software. If you want to check it out, we're developing exactly this, uh, this thing. It also provides with the, with the you know, this mechanism for recognizing what's the human state, it's all bundled into one, uh, into one toolkit made of a certain number of modules. The thing also, uh, let's say, manages the deployment of this distributed application of a cyber physical system. Uh, if you're interested, the architecture of this thing is a microservice-based architecture, basically containers. OK? 
tank, like Kubernetes or whatever. Uh, it's containerized and uh, they communicate the different components of this loosely coupled architecture communicate with a, with a pub sub uh, architecture, RabbitMQ and Kafka in some cases. And uh, yeah, the, all the organization is modular so that you just pick up the modules that you need. If you want a reservoir computing model, you, you have it. You just pick it up from the, from the library. Do you want to put on the top of it continual learning? You just pick up the continual learning model, the reservoir <coughs> computing model, you join them, you get a reservoir computing model with continual learning. <laughs> and then the application becomes just a Docker Compose YAML file in which you tell which models you need, how uh, they have some standard uh, interfaces. And if you want to deploy, you just run the, you, you just run the Docker Compose and then it de deploys stuff. And that's, that's basically it. That was the concluding bit uh, with the advertisement, but it was mostly to tell you that all this stuff that has been chattering uh, about, you can find implementation for, you can go on the, on the GitHub, uh, well, on the, yeah, on the GitHub of the project and you can download it and play with it. It supports very different architectures, Intel architecture, ARM, uh, ARM64, it has been tested on, also on embedded devices. So it's something that uh, we're still working on it, but enough about here to play around. Let me conclude. Okay, so possibly I've convinced you that reservoir computing is not a bad paradigm if you want to, de uh, to design efficient uh, recurrent neural network, okay? Especially because we need recurrent neural network if we want to keep the time let's say dimension into consideration when, you're, when we are uh, deploying a learning system. If your task has to do with time, has to do with the sequential nature of your data, you need this kind of models that can have a memory. And recurring neural networks allow you to have a memory without the hassle of training or supervisedly training by that propagation. It has nice properties, we believe, that support embedding, distribution, lifelong adaptation. We've talked about that. It has also this support for neuromorphic computing. We've seen that you can find actual physical implementation of reservoirs, even very weird ones. Okay. It's um <clears throat> why is this so important? I mean, this, this concept of neuromorphic computing, because so far we've been heavily, heavily limited. Uh, when people speak about uh, artificial general intelligence and deep learning, the classical, and, and they all ask you, are we getting there soon? Uh, I mean, are we there with the artificial general intelligence? I mean, a lot of people ask you to do that when you do dissemination events. The typical thing I respond is, I don't believe that is going to happen for a very specific reason, which is computational power. We simply don't have the computational power to emulate anything that is meaningful uh, to be called a human brain or something that has to do with the human brain. And this is much has to do with the limitations that we have in the fabric, I mean, in the way we're doing computing now. We are computing neural networks on the top of a computing fabric that is not adequate for, compute, for neural networks because we are emulating everything on the top of this phenomenon architectures in which you have separation of memory and computation. This is nothing, has nothing to do with the brain. The brain does not separate where we store the information to where we process it, okay? So uh, we're far from being there. Also because we, we're using, I think, the, the wrong computing fabric. And neuromorphic computing is a way of going towards different computing fabrics that can possibly or not uh, lead to, uh, to a revolution in terms of artificial intelligence. Certainly what it does, it does provide you with potential for you know, be more efficient, energy saving and computation. So uh, another thing, as you might have understood is that I believe it, it's reservoir computing is an interesting example, specific case of dynamical system computing. This again has to do with the fact that we are computing with neural networks with concepts that are not very natural to neural networks. Neural networks are things that don't uh, necessarily need to be implemented with a, within a digital system. Okay, neural networks, our neural networks are not digital. Okay. 
and the model that we're using doesn't need the computational model that we're using doesn't need to be digital it can be analog there are aspects in the in being analog that are interest the fact that we can have multiple solutions existing at the same time in a dynamical system is very interesting because it allows it that enlarges the potential of the neural networks and so I think that's an interesting direction of research and sort of reasoning about how can we transform the way we run and execute neural networks. It doesn't have to be necessarily on uh, the way we do it now. And yeah, another thing that I think it's particularly interesting here, clearly I'm really discussing thoughts and, and ideas for research is that we talked about continual learning. We talked about federated learning as they, as they are different things. But in my view, they are not so much different. They are just different dimension of, a, of, a, of, a, of the same problem, which is learning from experiences, from different experiences, not necessarily from data. Uh, what you would like, really, is a general learning paradigm in which you have a system that can be thrown with a model or with data and can learn from a model or from data. Typically, in uh, federated learning, you learn from model because you try to put together models. In continual learning, you try to learn from data uh, without storing the data. Actually, in some sense, federated learning is about learning over space, distributed over space, while continual learning is learning distributed over time because you learn in time new experiences. The two things in the end sum up to the same thing with the ability of incrementally adding new skills to your model. That's it. Whether these skills come from a different position in space or come from a different point in time, it doesn't really matter, I think. Or it does matter, but it shouldn't matter in terms of the how you formulate the learning problem, because it's basically just about incrementally adding new skills to a model. Where those skills come from. That's uh, since we are in uh, events also, let's say, supported by IEEE, let me just uh, pinpoint you to two uh, IEEE uh, task forces, which might be interesting if you want to uh, deepen uh, this randomization thing. One is the task force on randomized neural network, and the other one is the task force on reservoir computing. So if you're interested, you'll find those references also on, on the slides, which we will have available. And these are the acknowledgements to the people with, uh, which have heavily contributed to the presentation. I'm, clear, I'm clearly the one that goes around selling stuff, but they are the ones doing the actual job. So uh, thank you for, uh, for attending. And if I've left you enough time for questions, ask, but I'll be around for some other hours. So feel free to, to come and ask questions. Thank you. But we have time for some questions. Okay. Okay. Uh, I want to comment on this, but uh, maybe uh, I thought that one question. What do you think uh, are the worst aspects of uh, reservoir computing practice? <laughs> worse uh, for whom? And uh, I mean, can you be a bit more specific? Because Words can be different, different thing. Um, I mean, more difficult to use, or more yeah, kind of that, or memory uh, requirements, or energy requirements. Or... Okay, I'd say if we're if we go outside of the you know the usual motivations that you use and we start talking practically, worst aspects are that you need a heavy uh, a heavy model selection because you're just architectural bias. Okay. So that means that it's a lot of time spent in trying to understand and, and gain enough feeling to, to be able to, to know how many neurons, what kind of, uh, of things you need to explore in terms of uh, uh, random, uh, let's say, spectral radius or connectivity parameters. So uh, first of all, you spend a lot of time when you're learning how to do that. And even when you're enough expert to be able to restrict things, when you change the problem, you might be forced to start from scratch again. Okay, so that's a very annoying thing. 
because it's a lot of engineering with that. Okay? And this is something you probably don't want from a neural network. You want a neural network at which you throw things and the neural network magically comes out with answers. Okay, that's some of the case, but yeah. Yeah, I had the, the same experience. We did the general computing. Yeah. <laughs> It was uh, like I was uh, trying to replace LSTM with whatever it was. It was it wasn't working. working. Uh, in many cases, it doesn't work simply because it isn't the right model. As we said, I mean, it's only architecture bias, and there is a strong one, which is Markovianity, for instance. It's Markovian. If your problem is not nearly Markovian, you never ever solve it with the with reservoir computer. Okay. And the other thing is that. You need a lot of expertise and time spent in different applications to gain the magical feeling that you, you, know, you put your hands there and you and you feel what's the what's the problem. Uh, that's annoying, I understand.